we take a look back and forward. I think this airport's got a lot of great future coming for it. As the Iowa City Municipal Airport turns 100. Plus, get an overview of the final stage of construction on the Gateway Project. And kids get a chance to learn firsthand what it's like to be an emergency responder. And it all starts right now on this edition of Iowa City in Focus. The Iowa City Municipal Airport is celebrating a major milestone this year. From airmail to commercial flights, it's always played a crucial role in our community. And a look back at its history shows that it also left its mark on our nation's rise in aviation. 1918, that was the year the Iowa City Airport first opened. Fueled by the post-war aviation fever from World War I, the airport was a hot spot for clubs and flying enthusiasts. But in just a few years, it would become more than just a place for exhibition flights. The airmail service was looking for an airport in this area someplace to put on the route of the original airmail program. Only a year into its existence, the transcontinental airmail was struggling to prove beneficial when flying only during the day. The idea of continuing deliveries overnight meant the need for more airports to be added to its coast-to-coast -coast route. Iowa City proved to be the perfect stop for our state. And this became one of the very first airmail stops across the United States. From there, steps were taken to further legitimize aviation in Iowa City, including the shift to a municipal airport. Some of aviation's early pioneers landed here, including Jack Knight, Charles Lindbergh, and Will Rogers. The next step was commercial aviation, with the first passenger flight landing in 1927. Boeing Air Transport was the city's first contracted airline. The airport continued to shift roles over time. Over the years, it's played a number of roles, uh, starting from the airmail stop. It became a World War II training center. More than 2,500 pilots were trained at the airport between 1939 to 1944. And then from there, it served commercial aviation with airline service through the 70s. Carriers included United and Ozark Airlines. And now it's uh, one of the busiest general aviation airports in the state. There are several factors that keep traffic high. We've got a lot of services with the University of Iowa hospitals, a lot of business operators that can use the airport, and, and it's really an economic tool for the area. One of the biggest purposes for this airport today is business aviation. As a child, John spent a great deal of time in his father's business, which was located next to the airport. When I was a young kid, I remember being over at the uh, trucking business that we called the loading docks. Airplanes would literally fly into the airport. They would turn around and taxi off the north end of the runway and park in our trailer parking lot with our semi-trailers. And after completing his time with the Air Force in the 1970s, John began flying as a way to conduct business. Now, and it was critical to us. The aviation in small airports all around the Midwest in particular is where we'd go to do our business, to meet our customers. There are also a lot of enthusiasts who fly as a hobby. Uh, my name is Don Gurnett, and I first started flying at the Iowa City Airport on July 7th, uh, 1961. I fly in air shows and things like that. Living close to the Cedar Rapids Airport, he too became fascinated with aviation at a young age. We lived on a farm uh, just west of the airport, and all these airplanes would fly right over our farm. Over the past 50 years, Don has continued to see the Iowa City Airport expand. And there's been a tremendous growth here. Almost all these hangars, the new looking hangars around here, have been built just in the last few years. That growth came with some major improvements, including a terminal renovation, runway reconstruction, and new storage buildings. This airport is unique in the fact that it's been totally rebuilt in the last few years. This year, the airport is celebrating the major milestone of a century of flights and wants you to take part. We are planning an open house celebration for the weekend of June 8th through the 10th. There will be all kinds of activities, including a balloon glow with hot air balloons, plane rides, antique aircrafts, and much more. It's going to be a great weekend for free family entertainment. While the celebration looks back on past accomplishments, it's also a chance to set sights on what's next for the Iowa City Airport. So I think there's a very positive future, and other people must think that too because they keep building more hangars around here. We really got a, a bright future, I think. We're excited for the event, and we're excited for the next 100 years of the Iowa City Airport. Riding a bike and taking the bus are two great ways to get around Iowa City, but did you know you can combine the two? All buses in the city's transit system are equipped with bike racks located on the front of the bus. They're very easy to use. Here's some tips to make sure you have a smooth trip. 
First, make sure you don't have any items that could fall off while the bus is in motion, such as water bottles, bike locks, or pumps. When the bus arrives, make sure the driver is aware that you need to load your bike. Check to make sure it's safe to step in front of the bus. Squeeze the handle up to release the latch, then fold the bike rack down. Lift your bike up on the rack, making sure the wheels are in the proper slots. Once the bike is in place, place your support arm over the very top of the front tire. This will ensure your bike remains securely in place. Ride the bus to your destination. And again, remind the driver that you need to unload your bike. Raise the support arm off of the tire and remove your bike from the rack. Place the bike rack back up into the stow position. Combining these two modes of transportation is a great way to stay fit, save money, reduce pollution, and get where you need to go. Dubuque Street serves as Iowa City's main entrance and key gateway to our community. Two years ago, the city began a major project to reduce flooding on this road, which runs along the Iowa River. Here's an update on the Gateway Project as it nears completion. It's one of the city's largest construction projects ever. And it's getting closer to completion. This is the last stage, we're moving into stage four. The Gateway Project is raising Dubuque Street and replacing Park Road Bridge to reduce flooding on Iowa City's main entrance from I-80. This has meant reduced lanes and shifting traffic to allow for construction. Drivers and pedestrians will see another change during the final construction season. Which does include the critical closure of Park Road. Park Road Bridge closed in May. The new bridge is anticipated to open in about three months. We're looking at about 96 days for that critical closure. So everything will be open right before the fall semester starts the school year for Iowa City Community Schools and for football season. Closing the bridge is necessary to complete work along the river and connect the new bridge. To extend the retaining wall along the east bank and elevate those southbound lanes, we need to remove the east portion and the east abutment of the existing bridge. Detours will be in place for drivers and pedestrians. This closure will not impact the amenities on the west side of the Iowa River. During the closure, Upper City Park, Lower City Park, the pool, Hancher, all of those facilities will still be open. And crews are accelerating construction on that portion of work to make sure that the west end is completed before an estimated 12,000 bicyclists roll into town. We're expecting that whole west portion to be complete by July 24th or 25th, right ahead of Ragbri. During the bridge closure, completion of Dubuque Street will also remain a priority. At the same time, you're starting to see pavement go down on the northbound lanes of Dubuque Street. That includes work around the Mayflower Residence Hall. So you will also see some of that paving that was put down temporarily to turn CAN bus around. That'll be ripped out. Um, we'll start finishing off the frontage of Mayflower. And along Kimball Road. And we'll also begin between Kimball and Park Road, getting that northbound pavement down and elevating northbound lanes at Park Road. The Gateway Project has been a large endeavor, but we're nearing the end. It has been a long construction project, so we really appreciate all the patience that vehicles, pedestrians have shown. We ask that you just extend it for one more summer. At this point, things are just gonna get easier as we start to open up lanes and open the corridor back up and be construction free. This project is a big investment to our community. An average of 25,000 vehicles travel this portion of Dubuque Street each day. Reducing flood concerns and enhancing the aesthetics along the entryway is a step in the right direction. And as the project nears completion, city staff shares your enthusiasm. Excited. <laughs> it's a big project, so engineering division's pretty proud of it and excited to get it wrapped up. The pedestrian mile improvements project uh, includes the replacement of the brick paving. The reason why we're replacing that is because a lot of it is not ADA compliant and then also it's just a deteriorated condition. In addition to the paving that needs to be replaced, the underground utilities need to be replaced as well. We have some water main and some underground electrical. Both of them have reached their useful life and need to be replaced. We are doing all new site amenities. We're, we're doing a new staging canopy. 
We're doing some story walls, which will celebrate the history and literature of, of Iowa City. Also replacing benches, Big Belly Duel stations, which are the trash recyclers. The existing lighting system is in, in need of upgrading, so we're gonna have multi-level lighting for pedestrian level lighting. We're gonna have the stage and canopy will be lit. The story walls will be lit. We'll have some up lighting of the trees, some lighting on the fountain. The Penn Mall project is split up into two major phases. We have the Dubuque Street Corridor, which is phase one, and then the College Street Corridor is phase two. The Dubuque Street Corridor is a one-year construction season. It's for this year. We have phase 1A, which is the intersection of College and Dubuque, and that's set to complete at the end of July. Then we have the remaining portion of Dubuque Street, which is set to complete the end of October. And then we're going to follow up in 2019 and do the College Street Corridor. That starts in May of 2019. This finishes up in October of 2019. Part of the project, we are maintaining pedestrian traffic at all times. It's very important to the businesses to, to have their pedestrian traffic, so we've made a point to make sure all construction doesn't inhibit uh, pedestrian travel. So we work with the downtown district. They helped us develop signs that gives direction to the businesses throughout the, the corridor, so people should be able to find their way pretty easily. The pedestrian mall improvement project we feel is a very important project from the perspective that it not only replaces aging infrastructure but also keeps the downtown pedestrian mall vibrant by upgrading the not only utilities but the site amenities. We feel it's a it's a big investment for the city and, and it's a great project. Emergency responders are teaming up to offer a summer camp for kids. This is not only a great opportunity to learn more about these important professions, but it's also designed to build confidence in the participants. This is just a introduction into what we do and what our lives are like here on the job and in the firehouse. Good job, good job, keep going. Very good. All right, Cameron, you're up next. The emergency services youth camps give kids an inside look at the roles that paramedics, police, and firefighters play in our community. They see us on the streets and out and about and doing other things. This really allows them to see the nuts and bolts of what our jobs are actually like. This is a positive environment. We're having fun. We're laughing. We're learning something. Three. Four. The main goal is for them to enjoy themselves and learn something new about what they can do and what they're capable of doing. There are a variety of different reasons why kids want to get involved. I decided to take this camp because I wanted to learn how to do CPR and like how to help people. I thought about becoming a police officer. Learn how many times firefighters have to go like fight fires. I thought it would be really fun to go and do all the stuff, work with paramedic, police, and fire department. Over the course of two days, Participants learned first aid and CPR from paramedics, defense tactics from police, and a variety of different firefighter skills. Everything in the camp is hands-on. We don't have any classroom portions where we actually sit down and watch a PowerPoint. That approach definitely helps keep the kids engaged. I like how interactive it is and the firefighters and police officers are all really nice. The kids are actually interacting with everything they do, whether it be EMS, police, or fire. The kids quickly pick up on the important roles that these emergency services play in our community. They respond to lots of different calls. They always have the fire department with them. They rescue people and you get help out and stuff. It's very important, obviously, just because they come no matter what the emergency is. Beyond the practical skills, the program also aims to show kids their full potential. We really want them to walk away feeling more confident. They're definitely facing a lot of fears, whether it be heights or small spaces. So we build that self-confidence in them and we take it step by step. We're not forcing any of the kids to do anything, but we can challenge them a little bit. That they were able to choose to do something that was maybe uncomfortable or challenging, but by working together with some of their teammates or with some of us as firefighters, they're able to accomplish the goal. And it's, it's really fun to see. They get a chance to take these challenges head on. I didn't think I could pull out that much weight, but it turns out I can. It's tiring, it's like, because you have to lock your hands and keep your elbows straight. I thought it was just going to follow me and I'm going to spray everybody around me, but it was fun. 
it's a great overall experience for both the instructors. Our biggest goal is to have fun, and we take away something that we learn. And the participants. It's a lot of fun. The most difficult part for some <laughs> is picking a favorite activity. Everything? Everything? Yes, I like it a lot. I kind of realized that like, when I was a kid I didn't read very much, I didn't read very well, and my test scores always showed that growing up. I have a teaching background too, using that with the fire department to try and get kids more exposed to reading. Whoever reads the most gets to come here and do some firefighter stuff. One thousand five hundred seventy-five. Two thousand eight hundred seventy-eight. I won the most minutes for the month. Uh... Went over some of the medical equipment we used. Did some training on the fire hoses. I found out that they use the jaws of life and that they stay at the fire station for 24 hours. They help people that are sick. Someone gets injured or there's a fire, they come in the fire truck and help them out. When we sprayed the hose on the tree, because we got to pretend that we were actual firefighters and we were putting out a fire. I like about reading that you can find new books that you like and you can use your imagination if there's not any pictures. That you get to learn a lot. Hoping that um, we can expand more next year and that more schools are wanting to do it. I had a lot of fun today. When school is out for summer break, there's no reason kids can't keep their minds active at the Iowa City Public Library. And through a partnership with the city's transit, getting downtown is both easy and free. During the summer, Kids through grade 12 can ride any Iowa City Transit bus for free when traveling to the library. Just show your library card to the bus driver. Plus, adult caregivers can also get a free ride with the child. This offer is good on weekdays between the hours of 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. Young readers can catch a lift home anytime that same day with a ride and read bus pass. Just present your library card to the help desk to receive a bus pass for getting home. These are limited by card to one pass per day and only two passes per week. Take advantage of these great options for free transportation to and from the library. Learn more by visiting icpl.org. Our goal is to provide kids with the resources to explore diverse ideas, to exercise imagination, and express creativity.
Next time on Iowa City in Focus, are you ready for RAGBRAI? Details on what you need to know before thousands of cyclists roll into town. We'll see you next month for another edition of Iowa City in Focus.